Judge Joe Brown's all new barbecue sauce and seasoning, justice in the form of flavor. Law firms will take this as a retainer. What? It must be a law firm where they hungry as hell. Now you gonna help me with this parole I'm dealing with? Judge Joe Brown's all new barbecue sauce and seasoning, justice in the form of flavor. With one taste of our premium blends of all natural ingredients, herbs and spices, mm, you'll fall in love with meat all over again. Judge Joe Brown's all natural barbecue sauce collection is made up of two zesty flavors, original and spicy. There's only one way to bring order back to barbecuing. Just add Judge Joe Brown's all natural barbecue sauce and seasoning and you be the judge. Testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. Good evening, everybody. So before I bring the judge up, um, just a quick announcement. After this show, we up here for two hours. We will be heading over to the website to take your calls. So I've been saying that for the past couple of weeks, but tonight is tonight. So overtime on the website, therealdatanetwork.com. And you guys could call in, talk about what we talked about on the show or ask the judge any questions or make whatever statement. So let me know if you guys can hear me loud and clear <clears throat> topic. Okay. I put breaking news, but is it breaking news? Is I, I need to start putting the fanny saga or the fanny chronicles. Um, but as you can see on the thumbnail, it says bad boy crisis, right? Cause we have to touch on Diddy. I don't talk about a lot of pop culture, entertainment, celebrity stuff. However, you're talking about Homeland Security, FBI. Um, he has civil lawsuits, you know, um, about having sex workers and stuff like that. So, you know, we have to incorporate the law into it. So we're coming at it from a legal standpoint with the judges because he's the legal expert. And then, of course, Fanny, honey, the Democrats told her, shut up because you're talking too much. She's already being sued by the inmates. And I actually got an email from someone who was in the Fulton County Jail. And I am going to respond to that person. Um, so look out for the response today. So it's a, oh, and then um, today was the Georgia election case where the um, lawyers were discussing with Judge McAfee, um, arguing their claims to dismiss the case on the First Amendment and so forth and so on. So we have a whole bunch of fanny content to talk about tonight. However, I am going to start off the show with some other things before we get into the meat. So let me bring the judge up. Okay, the audio is good. Yes. Hi. Hello there. And how did everybody on X? Oh, and then we have to, we do have to mention, I saw my list, the Baltimore Bridge, and everybody's saying it was a scam, it's a cover up. So we'll get into that. However, how are you, Judge? Because I'm I'm not starting with the Baltimore Bridge or Fanny. I'm starting with something else. We can start. Can we start with that one if you don't mind? Well, it's a bridge? Yeah. Because we're going to talk about Diddy, you said, and yeah, Diddy but and Homeland Security. Homeland Security is investigating the boat on the bridge. <laughs> See, that's what Homeland Security does, is they investigate natural and man-made disasters. So the bridge coming down by the boat is a man-made disaster, which is why Homeland Security is doing that. So how does Homeland Security get from ship? Boat to Diddy, you see. So, is what it is. That makes sense. And FYI, I like you in black. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, well, speaking of the boat, so now there's all these conspiracy theories, and a lot of people are ex holding the spaces talking about some. It's a scam because they have not released the names of the men that were working on the bridge. They're in. They're not the people on the bridge, but the crew was Indian. So no, no, no. Yeah, the crew was in no, but the people that was working on the bridge itself. Released the that, 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 
that that and why would they release it because they probably didn't notify the families yet yeah well that's it there's no big conspiracy about that that's just decency you know some people were doing public service that was their job fixing potholes so why sit there and exploit them? But now one important thing to the discussion, I went and looked up the type of ship and it's got an interesting propulsion system. They have diesel engines that drive electric generators and the electric generators operate electric motors that are down in pylons that pivot like the bottom part of a outboard motor. So you can turn the propellers and guide this thrust and steer the ship. Those things are turned by electric motors. So if the electric power plant goes out, nothing's happening. You're just locked. So the crew called ahead and said, Mayday, we are out of control. We do not have steerage, nor do we have power. We can't reverse the props and slow down. We're going nine miles an hour. And it was apparently a dead weight cargo uh, ship of 25,000 tons. So that's going into this bridge. You got a mess. It could be conspiratorial. It could be something else to it, but it's not. I also went back and looked at the video where people say you can see the um, explosive charges going off in the smoke. Well, what you're looking at is more consistent in size and nature in smoke with quartz halogen lights or lamps going off. They have them on the bridge. They're strung on wiring. The bridge goes down. The wiring stays partially intact. As it does what it does, you see the mm -hmm. fill. Well, the elements burst. And that produces a minor explosion. And if it had been dynamite, they would have had a lot brighter blast. And the flashes you see are not consistent with where you would put explosive charges to bring down the bridge. Plus, why would you use explosive charges to bring down the bridge when yes, the ship could take them down? It's yeah, it's, don't don't it, explain how it's done because you can't do that no more. I know, but the deal is, no, that's just an accident. It's just like you have with airline disasters. It's a series they have on the Science Channel. Comes on sometimes in the summer. You know, you have three or four or five reruns a day. So what you're looking at is most likely to be the same kind of mechanical tragedy that you get when you have an airline problem. It may be the safest way to travel, but every now and then when something goes wrong, it goes down. That's like Boeing's executive, uh, chief executive left because the doors on the latest edition of the 50-year-old 737 went out or 45-year-old. Uh, I mean, I mean. Redact I do watch Redacted, um, Teresa. Redacted had a different angle than what's been shown. Yeah. And I meant to watch Redacted today. They, it's a YouTube channel. I really do enjoy their show on Redacted. I meant to watch it because I know they were talking about it, but I got busy doing something else because I, I do like and appreciate their angles because they also back it up. So, but my whole the whole premise, because I don't I'm not we're not trying to go into that rabbit hole. Um, it maybe, maybe we don't know if it's a cover up. Or it, it could have just been a genuine accident, right? Um, however, you know, um, <laughs> I, I want to go left with this. Yeah, well, look, I go look, left look, with this a little bit. Look at Scandinavia. They just had a thing two years ago. Several hundred people got jacked up when a ferry went down. You got that thing four years ago, five years ago, where that big cruise shipped out in the Mediterranean capsized. Hell, you got the Titanic. Anytime you have something on water where something made out of steel has to float on it, you have all kinds of messes that happens when you lose buoyancy or lose control. So, I mean, it may be conspiratorial. It may be something, but, you know, that's what all. Is, so what, is, what is this? What is Black Swan event? You know what that's that means? One of the ships. Huh? That's one of the boats that went down. Okay. Oh. All right. So. I want to go left with the Baltimore uh, bridge, right? <laughs> because I want to give me a minute. Let me, let me, let me, um, I'm trying to get good at hyping up the amp, the set. <laughs> 
So the mayor, Brandon Scott, responds to being called the city's DEI mayor. And of course, he was on um, Joy Reid on MSNBC. He is the mayor of Baltimore and he's young. Um, Very why, young. Why, why are you talking about DEI? First of all, why are you responding to people or other media outlets saying that you are a DEI mayor when you need to be focusing on the bridge? Never mind if they think you're not qualified. Do your job. But I want to play this clip. I know, and we all know, and you know very well, that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only uh, uh, straight, wealthy white men should have a saying anything. We've been the boogeyman from them since the first day they brought us to this country. And what they mean by DI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent. Uh, we know what they want to say, uh, but they don't have the courage to say the N-word. And the fact that I don't uh, believe in their uh, untruthful and wrong ideology and i am very proud of, proud of my heritage and who i am and where i come from scares them uh, because me being at my position means that their way of thinking their way of life of being comfortable and suffering and while everyone else suffers is going to be at risk and they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life i um i don't care that's not your job yeah what's that got to do with the bridge thing yes exactly exactly why are you responding when you respond when you respond to credit your critics you're going to respond to that and make this a whole and this is what i mean with the it's called -ness. immaturity yes so by you responding to he's a dei mayor you just showed your true age, your your maturity level, like you said, Judge, you are overly emotional. And maybe you don't know what you're doing because focus, what he should have said was, I am focused on getting the bridge, what happened to prevent it from happening, you know, in the future, fixing the bridge, um, thinking of ways for, you know, preventive to prevent this type of tragedy to happen. And I'm in the process of personally talking to the families of the people that perished on that bridge. That's it. Nothing about you being a black man, nothing about DEI, nothing about that's just another term for the N word. Focus, and, focus on your bridge. You know, and plus it's the other side that comes up with the three letter acronym for. What? What what the well, what, what he's claiming is a e -E diversity, yeah. equity, and inclusion. Yeah, that, that, that has nothing that. to do with you being a mayor. So, okay, yeah. uh, by now. definition, the people elected you. So, damn, what's that got to do with anything? And why would that even be relevant? Right. Unless and that's what I'm tired of. Like, I don't. Who cares what they say about you? Just focus on your job. Are you on X? Are you on X? No, I'm not. I'm okay. typing some notes relative to the. Yeah, but can you put the phone down so we can? No, I mean, I want you don't want me to forget them. It's about our topic, so I'm just taking some. We're notes. not on that topic yet. I know it's not on your topic right now. It's on another one, and it's also a couple of remarks about this. Uh, there is this thing before we leave this topic about this ship, this boat. One of the things that is inherent in the reaction to this is a presumption that everything's safe. It's not. And the world and existence in, on, and under the waters on land when it comes to the planet Earth are essentially dangerous. So a lot of the reaction presupposes presupposes that the element of danger no longer exists in the world. And that is a false assumption. It's a presumption. It's a dangerous presumption. So this is reflected by our inclination to try to see something conspiratorial or planned out so that this could happen. 
Now, I would offer this. If somebody were planning to do this, why would they call ahead the liver of Mayday so that the local law enforcement can restrict traffic onto that bridge to save lives and promote safety? See, if you wanted to, you would just deliberately ram it or if somebody wanted to set off a charge, uh, you're going to go through the fiction of the boat lost power in steerage way and could not reverse props. So it's obvious unless you want to destroy the vessel is going to be looked at carefully inspected and your story is going to be verified or debunked. And even if you sunk it, something that big you cannot possibly destroy short of a nuclear blast and even then you might get remnants so how are you going to keep the forensics from happening it's fairly shallow shallow water i think the depth in the channel is no more than 50 feet which is practically nothing when it comes to people conducting a salvage operation or diving onto a wreck so the likelihood of it being planned is not impossible, but it's unlikely. I mean, disasters do happen. And I think yeah. every now when a disaster happened, we automatically thinking, what is the government doing? Or is a conspiracy or foreign entities? So, you know, I don't know. It's now it's, I think it's a reach. However, when we look at the railroad derailments, the trains derailing, and so when that happened in East Palestine, I think it was two other train derailing, right? Yeah, and, two others. And basically, you know what the reason for that is? Lack of infrastructure, proper infrastructure. No, they got rid of the traditional caboose to save money. And they said they'd automated all of the sensors. That train from the footage they got from trackside cameras had been on fire, or at least those bearing boxes for about five miles and had there been Mark one eyeballs in a caboose, they would have picked it up. But quite recently they took them away. And then in that cold weather, you reduce the tolerances because metal shrinks mm -hmm. and you've got greases and lubricants that aren't properly formulated for the cold weather. So the spaces shrink, the friction builds up, heat builds up. And you get what in old time real parlance used to be called a hot box. That's why when the train stopped, you'd see the engineer or the guy in the caboose, man, they'd go by with the big, huge oil containers and they'd lubricate the bearings so they didn't get that way. So, you know, this is somebody's idea of technology. It doesn't work. Thank you, Enoch Abif, for the super chat. Thank you. And guys, please hit that like button, thumbs up. I have not said it once until now. And if you would like to donate, just hit the dollar sign um, and donate um, with a question or um, statement or just showing your support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, and then Rochelle says, Mercury is in retrograde. It affects electronics and travel. <laughs> I hope not. But moving on um, to, I want to highlight this. Where is it? Because I know I saved it. I sent you the video of um, the cartoon of Good Times. Oh, here you go. And guys, <laughs> just to let you guys know, I pinned the petition to boycott this Netflix um cartoon in the in the chat so please click on it and sign the petition um i'm going to be talking about that petition but i want to um share this right so it's called good times animation show and it's supposed to come out on netflix oh this is the actual petition i'm trying to find the actual um video for this give me a second because it was an actual cartoon let me bring this back here and i'll go through here oh here we go i just keep going past it all right here we go 
uh, yeah. So this is a trailer for the sitcom series Good Times, an animated revival of the 1970s sitcom, right? And it just dropped. Um, so I want to play it and then, you know, we could briefly talk about it. But a lot of people now on X is saying a oh, boycott it. And I agree because it's pure ignorant mess. Um, I have a problem with that. I like it better than the original. It's less demeaning and less stereotype, but it does deal with some realities that are embarrassing. And it's a satire, I think, because it is taking stuff that we glorify, we promote, we put in our entertainments, it's in our rap music, our hip hop uh, ideation, in what we go to the movies and see and what I hear in the conversation around uh, in certain quarters. So why is everybody worked up about it? Uh, unless they're worked up about it in the real, uh, in the real world as well, but nobody seems to want to pay attention to it. Look at the footage on X of the girl Rillas battling in the fast food place because they didn't get enough ketchup packets or Look at the idiots getting upset and fighting in the malls because somebody started asking them not to try to proselytize and convert the customers. And look at the ones that are upset because they got shoplifted in the act of, or requested to act like they have some manners and get to acting foolish. So uh, you like that? You tune into TikTok and Instagram and you watch all of the videos and a bunch of fools are acting fools instead of everybody starting it, everybody's holding their cell phone up trying to tape it. So, I mean, why are people upset about it if you patronize the garbage any damn way? And by the way, the first one, I was a grown man. When the first one came out, I found it demeaning, insulting, and filled with stereotypes. And I find out years later, 40 some years later, so apparently did a lot of the cast and crew. Well, Norman, they at, so it, so the executive producer is Stephen Curry, Norman Lear, and Seth MacFarlane, right? Um, the thing is, you know, if you found the original to be stereotypical, so so this one in 2024 is that as well. Oh, yeah, it is. The problem is they always show the negative and the worst and the bottom feeders of black culture. Yeah, well, that's what the original is. It's a bunch of bug dancing buffoons. So that's the character they play. And the one in there, the guy that played the father that wound up having to leave because he just said he couldn't stand it any longer. Uh, they try to make him a villain, but the most offensive one was that JJ character. I think they brought him back for some commercials, but I mean, he wasn't entertaining. It was foolishness. And he tried to do a comedy circle around the country and people just walked out because it wasn't funny. They didn't have a laugh track to it. So well, it was. I think because JJ played the fool majority of the time, and it's like it's one thing to be silly and funny, but he played the. It fool. wasn't funny to me. It was disgusting and insulting. So this thing, it's insulting. But the problem is, is it's more founded in truth than the first one was. And what you're looking at is oh so typical of some of the people that call in here or on X when we have X space and some of them that post on X, you're looking at X participants, some of them in that trailer that we saw. Right, right, right. No, I, I totally get what I totally get it. I mean, it, it's not, I don't get the, they're glorifying it, but you know, maybe somebody else will take it the way it might be intended, which is as, a satire. Look at you damn fools. This is how you act. This is where you live. What did that white girl say when uh, 
she talked about what the neighborhood looked like. Yeah, I mean, shit hole. your neighborhood's a shit hole. Yeah, it, it looked like a shit hole. And it's like, but it's like, but Trump said I, that, so she's like regurgitating a Trump. Yeah, line. And the other thing is, is I was listening to something on X Space the other day. You see, you be a racist because black folks steal. That's just the fact of life. No, and nothing right about stealing from somebody else, particularly your neighbors. Black folks, see, we do no, ain't nothing right about that. You just a heathen, uncultured, ill-raised buffoon. So there's nothing cool about that. Right. And we glorify it. So somebody made an animation about it and now. Well, maybe the people that are offended are the people that are quietly offended by some of the real behavior that goes on. Well, I'm offended and I'm not quiet about it. I can't relate to that. And I honestly, I couldn't relate to good times because I did not grow up in the projects. Now, you know, yes, my parents were married, but they kind of they divorced when I was young. But it's a, I did not grow up in the projects. I did not grow up poor like that, right? But at the same, so I even this new one, it's like you have people that have project or poor mentality and, you know, but they, they want to live their life like hip hop artists. I can't relate to that either. So I can't relate to this, but I think it's a disgrace that this is the only thing that they show as if this is the only type of current representation of black culture. And that's just not true. And listen it, to hip hop, baby. What are you listening to? Listen to the crowd. But that's what the only thing to? that they want to promote. If you are well, talking, I know that. That's what we buy it. I don't, but right, you're right. But you're yeah, right. I mean, what we're doing is trying to say that's bullshit. Why do you do this? But now, see, I like this because it gives people a graphic visual illustration. You know, we can't read anymore. We got to have five, 10 second sound site or ha ha ha. It's got to be funny or it's got to be something with a beat to it. So let them look at it and see what they look like. True. But I don't like it, but I mean, it's like. Well, there is a petition because there are a lot of people right now on X that when it was circulating, like, oh no, this is trash. And I did put the petition in the chat, guys. So please. Sign that petition. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're Asian, black, everybody sign it because it's not healthy for this nation to keep having things like that thrown down our throats. You know, come on, mix it up a little bit, mix it up a little bit. But that right there, no, that's just pure garbage. Like how, how much guns and jury and and shenane looking and you know the little baby and the baby like just how much buffoonery <laughs> and see the other thing is it fits into the stereotype right there the guns don't cause that problem i mean it's the other stuff that causes that problem guns are just a tool um i want to ask you know, about norman lear do you think that he intentionally exploited black people and, and, and black culture in a negative way? No, it didn't. As a matter of fact, he did an interesting thing with the integration of um, Little Rock High School when Falbus was doing his stuff. It's a picture of a little black girl being escorted by U.S. Marshals into uh, Little Rock High School. Falbus was standing in the doorway as a governor saying, as long as I'm governor of the sovereign state of Arkansas, there will be no Negroes attending this high school. Um, well, not so much that high school, but some of the other schools. And by the way, Falbus, I saw in 1972, proudly introduced Joe Biden as the next great young Dixiecrat on the horizon. So, yeah. I don't find that Norman Rockwell was a racist. I just find that he used his art. I'm sorry. I'm talking about Norman Lear, not Norman Rockwell. Lear. Oh, Lear. Lear. Okay. I thought you were yeah, talking about no, the art. Norman Lear. Do you think Norman Lear was exploiting? No. 
black culture in a negative way. No, the whole black industry is exploited because guess who pays the tab for most of the rap video that gets sold from Tokyo to Berlin to Moscow to Rome to Pretoria to Sydney? Uh, and how and how, why they make the money and why that art form, because it is so profitable, is stagnated for 45 years. As long as term something has lasted is hip hop. I mean, nothing else would last pop in the last 150 years of American entertainment past 10 years. So this has gone on 45, perhaps 50 years. Why is it? Because it's paid for, bought, and most of the artists are too damn scared of getting the money cut off by those who have distribution rights and they've bought into controlling the copyrights on the stuff that they do. So, I mean, what else is new? So they just put it visual. So, I mean, when you hear this stuff, you don't get a visual image of what's being talked about. True. This is like, what is that? They did a video on it uh, the, for several lovely young women. They, I even liked the sound of the music. And one of them was running down there because her punk son got gunned down dealing with drug trade and she's crying about it. And it was an interesting visual to go along with the audio. So this is just visual that goes along with the conceptualizations that we buy and we hear ourselves do, what do they say in there? They, we call each other the N-word all the time. Man, he ain't got to be a real N if he want to be, you know, like, what's wrong with you? Well, you know, it's said friendly. No, it's not. That every time you say it and refer to yourself that way, your subconscious knows the negatives. You're just telling it to yourself, so don't lie to yourself. You don't think much of you, and that's why you have such a poor self-concept uh, and you don't per perceive that you have it in you to do anything. So you whine, bitch, and cry about what gets done to you. You don't have the balls, courage, the ingenuity, or the personal outlook to go stand up to the adversity and do something about it. Well, this is why I will always respect and, you know, honor and appreciate Bill Cosby because Black people stop waiting for an outsider to show you who you are, create it yourself. And you could create the positive and the accuracy of, you know, of black culture. Um, and it could be entertaining because the Cosby show, phenomenal show. And it was about a black family professionals. Right. Um, and you can relate to it, whether you were poor or not, you know, middle class, lower class, upper class, wealthy, um, a different world, you know, so you can create, we can create greatness. Just do it, do it because it was harder for the Bill Cosby's, the Sidney Poitiers and other, you know, uh, people in the entertainment during that time to actually create something in our image that was positive or even if it was negative it was much harder it's so much easier now with all this technology and social media and you know the phones and everything so why just go do it stop regurgitating garbage and make 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 something beautiful and magical and and influential you know, something that something that you will be proud that your grandchildren, you know, will look up. You will be proud. Your grandchildren will be proud of something that you created. So like and that's how I think of things now. Like, what will my grandkids say? You know, what will my legacy when I'm gone? How will they look upon some of the things that I have created as a content creator? How would you know how, what would they think of me? So, yeah. And if you want them to think of you as a street thug or a ratchet city girl or whatever, then that's your prerogative. But hey, there's so much more. I was saying that to another one. Hey, even white folks are saying, hey, it's about pimping your ride. Hey, pimp it out. Hey, man, it's about pimping, man. You know, and uh, what time <laughs> is it? 
What is that pimp? I used to represent a lot of pimps and hogs. They kept the secretary paid, the rent paid, you know, the insurance paid. Uh, they were good for business. But pimps are some of the most disgustingly slimy individuals you can think of, and they suck more dick in the penitentiary than anybody but the pedophiles. So, I mean, that's what you want to be. It's all about pimping, man, you know, hey. And um, even what was it? The, the Mac, Max Julian. Thank you, Heather. Max Julian went to John Muir Junior High School. He was in the same class I did, and he got run home so much. It was really kind of, mm -hmm. you felt for him, you know. So bottom line is, is that's what you want to image on how well, you support yourself. I got all my B's and H's, my A's. They take care of me. You know, like. Thank you, Catman. He says, contrast this with the old Amos and Andy TV show where blacks were shown to be doctors, lawyers, and hardworking individuals. It was yanked off the air. Well, yeah. Amos and Andy started out by some white guys on the radio. They initially tried to start them in this series that was running Saturdays as a matinee at the movie theaters on a continuing basis. They couldn't get away with white people in blackface. So this was after World War II. So they started having black folk. The interesting thing is, is there was a black courtroom in a black precinct in Miami that was staffed by black people, black judges, and the black cops operated out of that. They weren't allowed to arrest white people, but only blacks and Cubanos, if they were dark Cubanos, and they modeled the courtroom in Amos and Andy after the one in Miami. So I visited that and paid some attention and had long and interesting conversation with the first black chief of police for the Miami Police Department, and we looked at some pictures. It was a class picture of the graduating class he was in where he was the first black cop to go to the main training academy. So they took a picture with him. And then after he left, they took one several hours later with all the white guys with him out of it. Mm -hmm. He was allowed to patrol downtown for the first time, but he could not arrest white people until he had been on the department for a while. Um, I spoke my crew to him and his wife. We did an interview. Mm -hmm. um, but that was modeled on an actual courtroom where some black lawyers were permitted to practice in. And that's where you got that whole thing. It come to judge. Right. And, and a black judge. And, and we also got Sapphire and we even have a continuation for that. We got Miss Fanny up there in the corner. She's Sapphire to the day. <laughs> you know, that's. Yeah. I, so I switched the thumbnail on the thumbnail on the, on, the, on YouTube is Diddy. Uh, we're going to get into it, it, it. We're going to get into him in one second. Well, right after I bring up this one quick topic, but I, but she's the main focus. Um, Fanny Panny. So, yeah, um, I want to, you know, what I say about the Democratic Party, they go recruit light, likely little black girls and make them bed winches. And if they're good, they get up to the third floor, third floor bed winches. And then when they get gray in the roots, they make them mammies and put them in charge of the plantation. All right. So just hold on the mammy, um, the mammy, the mammy and a fanny talk. I want to go to, um, I kind of want to stay a little bit on television, but it's a mixture of politics. So last week I watched the show Shirley on Netflix. It was very, very, it was a good, it was a good movie. And I must, I love Regina King. She is a great, 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 great actress. And she portrayed um, Shirley Chisholm. She did an excellent, excellent job. Right. So I give Regina King her props. Um, and it's out on Netflix called Shirley. And she, you know, like I said, she was playing Shirley Chisholm. This is the actual Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black woman to be elected into Congress. Um, and then she was the first woman, or I know she was definitely the first black woman to run for president. I don't know if she was the first black person to ever run for presidency. Um, 
So you didn't watch it, but you don't have to watch it because you lived through that era, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the woman, Shirley Chisholm, during that time. Wasn't a concern at the time. We're talking about revolution and some severe changes that needed to be said. And her position on guns didn't match ours. So we were somewhere on the East Coast. What was her position on guns? Uh, anti. So that wasn't something we favored. So anyway. She had a lot we, of support from the feminist movement during that I time. I know, and we weren't into that either. So, Even, right. I mean, I'm sure she did something. So let me ask you this, because um, her focus in Congress was the veterans, um, I guess, women rights and equal pay, also immigration and refugees, because, you know, she she was born here, but her parents are from the Caribbean. However, you said you just said that you guys were not into the feminist movement, but mm -hmm. they were black women linking up with the feminist movement. At of that course, time. we had that. We had, for example, Nikki Giovanni got roundly cussed out at a BSU meeting at UCLA the second time she appeared there. There were about 10,000 people, mostly feminists, and a few black of uh, the black students at UCLA in attendance at Pauley Pavilion. And she was talking some poison about the worst thing that could happen to a child is to have a man participate in the child's upbringing. And she was advocating that if women wanted to be mothers, they should simply find a tall, strong, handsome, smart guy, get knocked up, and then don't tell the SOB he's the daddy because that would just ruin the children. So she was advocating that, and we told her that was going to contribute to the destruction of the black family and everybody else's. And she attended this BSU meeting, which was fairly heavily attended. She got cussed out. I know I helped in the process, but see, that's what feminists were saying. That was 67, 68. And it was poison. Right. But that was it the beginning. Through, I would say that well, was the beginning of this big divide between black men and black women. It wasn't the beginning of the big divide. What it was is it goes back a lot further. Decent black women always appreciated uh the plight of black men and how hard we had to work. As a matter of fact, around here, even now, if you go to certain places and you get senior black women at a household when they have a big dinner or something, they ensure that the men get to eat first and get satisfied before the women are allowed to serve themselves because they say we need to, we meaning they, the women, need to appreciate what black men have to go through if they're going to be good men. Now, that's always been the case, but there was always a segment of the population that was used to the plantation being the mammies and uh, being in charge of everything and having the specific assigned task of denigrating black males and keeping them in check. So that was a small part of the population back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, but it started building up because they bred a lot under the safety net that came about with the Johnson administration's nominally good intentions. So well, it got to be a widespread poison, and you get mammy fannies right now who... Uh, and, I know, I, I totally get... I know, I know. Into. It's like they've been sponsored and they're the ones that get through college now. They're the ones that uh, get promoted. They're the ones that respond to the heavy influx of feminist-oriented female teachers in the school system. Uh, you get black boys out there, and they've got a harsh world where death is a familiar companion in their homes and neighborhoods, and you've got somebody with a bunch of spangles around her arm flourishing as she gets them to sing itsy bitsy spider went down the water spout you know like what the hell does that have to do with their circumstances mm -hmm. so it, well, it's 
endemic and it's expanding is a problem again. Well, just real quick, the swing. I want to swing back to Shirley Chisholm real quick. When she was running, I, I, when she was sure running for Congress, because, when she was running for Congress, she was running up against James Farmer Jr. And um, excuse me, and I saw the great debates. That movie last night was excellent. But he, when they did do a debate, when they debated each other and. I was on the phone with you reading an article. He was focusing on her being a woman and being emotional. And, you know, basically women need to let men lead, especially black men. And she was focusing on, you know, the actual um, tangibles that the people needed, particularly women, because she knew her voting base. She said majority of the people that vote are women. Women do need daycare, access to affordable daycare, because it does help out with the family, because both people at the time had to work, um, education, veterans. She was focusing on the issues to where he kind of focused a little bit more on the gender, whether he was right or wrong. And he was a liberal he he got support from the Republicans to whereas Shirley Chisholm got, she was a Democrat. And I said to you, if he had won, right, knowing that he got support from the Republicans during that time, would the outcome of public policy specifically for black people in that district of Brooklyn, right, black and brown, but black people, do you think it would have been more beneficial policies, public policies for more economic development and less of a um, social service handout? I don't know. Okay. It depends. The vicissitudes of the past and they're carrying over into the present uh, are not clear but i can say this that was part of the process that leads to mammy fanny and such like so it okay. was a trend where they found that black females could get elected because it brought in a coalition of white females to support them so the black folk wanting somebody black and the white female who was a feminist added to it equal electability whereas you had a very few people like adam clayton powell for example who got ejected from congress got back in and they refused to seat him after the people in Harlem elected him. He was a preacher out of Abyssinian Baptist Church at the time. So you got a lot like that. They said he had too much money and too much power and he had an island that he had. So well but so the 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 correlation or the it, it, this correlation I, because and I I'm gonna I I don't want to stay too long in this because I kind of want to cater a show for this uh, on Twitter next week because the, the point I'm only trying to make here is especially back then right because I just think men now are just so broken to us but I'll say that for Tuesday but the point I'm trying to make is between James Farmer Jr. and Shirley Chisholm who was the better candidate and I and I feel as though that James Farmer would have been focused more on economics, um, economic yeah, quality. Surely, whereas women, wait, 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 women, women in general, they focus on social needs and men. Now, focus and, on yeah, and see, she was a harsh critic. We could have been on the Mar on Mars by now, but she was a harsh critic of the space program, and she just castigated it at every chance say we don't need to waste money on science and technology because they've got so many poor people that need to be taken care of. That's welfare state stuff. Right. So, I mean, it was a big table at the time, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York had black men as mayors, Washington DC did. Okay. Virginia had a black man as governor. And you had Atlanta had a black man as a mayor, a series of them. So, yeah, that was room at the table. But the problem was, is that's not what's going on right now. You've got some sissy boys. Uh, what does Arnold Schwarzenegger say? Girly men that are sitting at the table these days and they whine about stuff and they can't get out in the streets and leave. So 
you've got a big problem. And it's like Clarence Thomas. Okay. Well, I don't want to go. Repu no, I, I'm not going to say that. I'm just using them as an example of what this is. Uh, the Republican Party was in at the time, and they tried to get an arch conservative who essentially was a simplistic fool, well, a Bork, as a Supreme Court justice. They couldn't get him in. So what they did is they picked Clarence Thomas, who had no experience, no trial experience. Uh, he was being rewarded for being a hatchet man to destroy EEOC, but no, uh, none of the liberals in opposition could challenge him because he was black. You see, this was the, the thing. You pick a black woman and nobody can challenge her. So the feminists and the people that were into the entitlement thing, the early edition of it and the dependency thing could get what they wanted because nobody will attack these people. This just wasn't politically correct. Right. So well, I don't have anything against a woman. I'm sure she probably was fine. I just wouldn't pay that much attention to her. Right. Um, well, I want to follow up with that discussion uh, on Tuesday in uh, XPix. I think that'd be great. Um, all right. So let's Eddie, right? Because <laughs> he's on the thumbnail. And then we're going to get into Fanny Panny. Where is Diddy? Nobody can't find him. Nobody can't. We, we nobody hasn't seen him since he's been pacing around the Miami airport. But this is the thing: no criminal charges have been filed. Um, he has not been arrested. And I put a poll in the chat saying, you know, will he be arrested? Yes, no. Will he pay his way out? He does have a couple of civil lawsuits, civil, and one of the lawsuits by this guy, Little Rod. You know, saying, listen, he owes me money because I produced nine songs on his last album, and he has not paid me. He was trying to pay me with girls and 90K, but no publishing. And I said no. But also in that civil lawsuit, he's listing all of these nasty, demonic um, behaviors, you know, deviant. Let me say de deviant, not demonic, deviant behaviors with sex parties and drugs and blah, blah, blah. And he got he also named names. Right. He named 50 Cent Baby Mama saying she was Diddy's sex worker. Um, he named this young, this rapper Young Miami saying, listen, he would have her transport cocaine. They called it pink, co pink cocaine. He named this other man saying he was his drug mule and all these other celebrities or whatever, right? And I was listening to Gene Dean. He was former security for Diddy um, back in the day. And he said the reason why in his civil suit that man laid out a lot of things, right? The things that Diddy did to him, drugging him, and other people who was participating is because if it goes to trial, right? If it goes to trial, then those would be witnesses that would be called up and they would be under oath. This is civil. This is not criminal. And as we reported on Monday... You know, his home in Miami, L.A., and New York was raided by the FBI and Homeland Security, right? Could I interrupt you right there? There's one little interesting part about that. He got the home on the West Coast raided, and he got one mansion raided in, my, in Florida. But interestingly enough, he had a second mansion on the same lot that wasn't touched. So why did they raid only one, well, search one mansion? Then they talked to him at the airport and let him go on out of the country. So what in the world is going on? Why do you raid? Well, not raid. That's I don't call that a raid. Why do you well, search? Well, well, it was a raid because they did take electronics. Yeah, but that's not what a, they call a raid. A raid is when you're going in to arrest somebody. This is oh. search, the search warrant. Mm -hmm. See, so why do they search one mansion on the West Coast? And why, when there are two mansions on the same lot, just right next door, you know, walk, you only search one of them. So I find that very strange. And also, again, the mandate of Homeland Security is to deal with control of the borders, immigration, and customs. It's mm -hmm. to control man-made and natural disasters. That's the boat. That's 911. It is to deal with 
the manifestations of terrorism and cyber attack. It is to secure the physical security of the United States. How did they get involved in the drug trafficking thing that is typically the FBI since the FBI came into existence 111 years ago for the specific, 112, 13 years ago for the specific purpose of setting up the Mann Act, transportation of females across state lines for illicit purposes, which the well, Mann maybe, Act most maybe recently the, maybe they the prosecuted race. R. Kelly. Maybe. Okay, listen, because I want to ask you some questions. I don't want to go down that diatribe of something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm still it's trying like, to figure out. He hasn't, what been, he hasn't been charged yet. So the question, you know, the question that I want to ask you is. No, he hasn't been charged. Right. So which I'm is. Saying, why, why with Homeland Security. I don't know. That's the, we don't, we don't know. We don't, that's the thing. We don't know. That's the conspiracy. Is Homeland Security, did they get the go ahead from a power up person that's powerful than a president saying he has some videotapes and we need to go in there and get it because it's going to expose some people that don't need to be exposed. They, 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 they took all the videotapes. They took all the cell phones, all the computers, all the laptops. He had cameras in every room. They took all that. So they took all of the electronics. Well, here's the thing. So it's a, are they trying to cover what's, cover up what's on those tapes so it's not about no, that, that's not what they're trying to do here's what they usually do in my experience of defending people as a lawyer trial lawyer and being involved as a consultant consultant in other action with defense related firms is usually when a federal agency goes in there and says it's up to something that it does not have in its mandate. That's a cover because they're trying to get something on somebody to turn them into a snitch. Mm -hmm. So they might have gotten cameras and everything, video footage and all of this other stuff. It could have been that he was in a position to blackmail people and they just simply retrieved the evidence. It could have been incriminating the other people or they might be trying to turn him as a witness for the government. That last one is what they usually try to do when they go in there and they say, for example, famously the FBI will say, we went in there to uh, deal with uh, an investigation where the person was doing such and such and such allegedly. Well, it's not a federal crime, it's a state crime and the FBI doesn't involve itself with investigating state crime. So it's usually a cover under those circumstances they're trying to get something on somebody so they get leverage to turn him to the use of the federal agency and going after somebody else. Question. I have one. I have three questions. Is Diddy the new face of sex trafficking? As you think they're trying to paint him the new face and then paint hip hop as a sex trafficking industry? Well, they get too much money out of that industry, and there are too many people in high places, including Pete O. Joe in the White House, who are caught up in that kind of outlook. So. Knowing what I know about a lot of people in the Democratic Party, that would be kind of shooting yourself in your own foot. But it is what it is. So let's see. Because somebody got to be the fall guy, right? Well, it doesn't have to see. This is the problem. When you start trying to get somebody the fall guy, you put yourself in uh, Mammy's position over here. In the process, you start telling on yourself. So they're dumb enough not to have this abject lesson staring them in the face. All right. Second question. Do you think he will be arrested? Possible arrests? Probably. I have no idea. Probability. They, they could get an arrest warrant issued by a federal magistrate, but more likely than not, what they would probably do is submitted to a grand jury, or if they think they are, they would give him notice since obviously he's got counsel and he can afford it. Uh, they would give notice to his designated representative that they intend to submit him for indictment and based on negotiations, they might submit the matter for an indictment with a low cap. 
in the federal system, they cannot plea bargain in terms of time. So what they do is they bargain in terms of what he's pleading guilty to and the language instead of uh, I'll offer him a chance to cop to three years or five years. What you say is we'll let him plead out or we'll indict him on something with a five year cap or with an indeterminate cap under five years, you know, with fines or with a 10 year cap. Now in the feds, if you get a five year cap, that means you are liable to a minimum of 60 months in a federal penitentiary, which depending upon your good and honor time will probably mean that at best, at you will serve about 56 months in federal custody and you get four months off mm -hmm. in a state system of five years sentence. You might get out in uh, mm -hmm. two, three months. I just did a poll um, in the beginning of the show. I said, well, did he, will, will did he get arrested? 64% said yes. 19% said no. And then I also added a third. Um, he will pay his way out. 16% wrote it for. You can't pay your way out on a federal case. It doesn't happen. No, even the judges don't have any discretion. That's one of the problems with the federal system. Biden, Stennis, Eastland, Byrd, and some others put in place a sentencing change that took place 44 years ago that give the judges no discretion. In mm -hmm. fact, that's up before the Supreme Court on another matter right now. Um, the well, judges have no discretion. They can't exercise their authority to say, okay, this guy's a good guy. I'm not going to require him to go to jail. They don't have any choice. They've got a long checklist and they go down mm -hmm. and depending upon what's on the checklist, that's what he gets. So if this is, if this term's criminal, it would be federal criminal because Homeland Security rated? Well, the FBI was there, but you see what happens is there might well, be about indicted in three different states, Miami, LA, and New York. Yeah, well, that would still be FBI. That's the FBI thing. So you got the FBI there. So I can conceive if you want to get conspiratorial how the FBI might delegate or deputize the homeland security people to act in concert with them or to assist them. And there's a cover going on to disguise what they're really up to. See, the difference between a federal prosecution and a state prosecution is essentially this. The only thing the feds have to tell you about what they're doing is simply what the charge is. They don't have to designate the elements. They don't have to tell you who the witnesses are. They don't have to tell you what the theory of the case is. They are required, if a person testifies, to supply the defense with a copy or a transcript of their grand jury testimony, but they don't have to tell you anything. And I know from personal experience of conducting federal defenses, the worst thing ever is to have to deal with a really innocent person who doesn't know what the hell's going on. So what you hope for is partial verdicts of not guilty and hung juries on the rest so you can use the trials for discovery. And you might find that you are in one, two, three trials before the whole thing's over and get continuous partial not guilty verdicts and you find out more about the case. For example, your chief witness who was overdone according to the feds had a second grade education and he was a dumb bunny. Then you find out, oh, wow, this dude had a master's degree from Virginia Union, a uh, master's of business administration degree from Virginia Union University. He's been doing this since he's 19 years old and he's 58. And he was defrauding the government on 148 other activities. And the government wanted this guy so badly that they concealed it. So we didn't know about it until we'd been through two trials already. And we found out finally in terms of third, you know, this is the way feds do. They have trial by ambush. So Biden, you can thank him, not the crime bill in 1994, but the one in 1979 and 1981 he participated in. So the feds can try you by ambush. 
like San Francisco had a case where the jury convicted this guy of unlawful possession of marijuana. This has been recent. The jury was not permitted to hear that he was a sworn officer for the state of California and San Francisco carried a badge and gun and he was taking samples of this marijuana for analysis for medicinal certification. They couldn't hear that. So they convict this guy for possession of marijuana in a felony amount. And he's a law enforcement officer doing his job. See, that's that kind of trial by ambush. That's what the feds do. And you can thank, thank the guy in the White House for that. And that was way before 1994. I'm muting myself. All right. Another question. Last question on Diddy. Is this Diddy thing a distraction from the Fannie Willis, the election, you know, any everything else that's going on? Do, do you think it's a discretion? Dis, it's quite like it is. Huh? Quite likely it is. Because they do stuff like that. Yeah, you've got, where is the headquarters for Homeland Security located? Washington, D.C. Oh, environment. The tri-state, the tri-area, the DMV area. Where is the FBI's headquarters located? The DMV area. Mm -hmm. D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. So, You've got them right in there, and they're a national organization. Now they're trying to do everybody one worse. They just armed up 83,000 IRS agents who have even more information sources than the FBI and the Homeland Security folk who get a feed in from IRS. You now making are making them effectively the secret police for the United States. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they weren't armed before, and they usually relied on the FBI to go carry out places, things when they needed arrest. But the FBI at one point was an unarmed federal agency until J. Edgar got the blackmail, the blackmailing certain elected officials to allow them to carry guns. So now you have another non-armed federal agency with a lot of information sources who are becoming armed, mm -hmm. 83,000 of them. So I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to share uh, this little quick clip, right? It's a video from years ago with um, Diddy. I think he was called Sean Combs back then with Barack Obama. Uh, let's see. So thank you. <laughs> and, and, and I just want to say how much I appreciate Puff Daddy. For, for doing the kinds of work that he's doing because he doesn't have to do this. Uh, but this is part of what is important about giving Since back. Since we applaud you, I and, and I want to apologize for not sweating, but I but I do this so much. I, I'm so cool. I just want y'all to see everybody I'm interviewing is sweating. I'm not even touching my brow. I'm so cool. And I want to apologize. I ain't trying to make you look bad or nothing like that, but I'm just so cool. Um, we, 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 we. T-shirt. <laughs> I tell you, if he was wearing one of those fancy designer clothes he's designing, he'd be sweating just like me. The guy's good. All right. So, <laughs> like I said, <laughs> you got to be careful what you do. This fool, Mammy Fanny up here showing you the pitfalls of trying to go after somebody when you're vulnerable too. They love them some old Mammy. Right. And so 50 Cent, he posted a, um, a screenshot of Fox News. Um, is the Rodney Jones civil complaint documents. And this is a piece of it. it says, Mr. Combs had hidden cameras in every room of his home, has recordings of several celebrity artists and music label executives and athletes engaging in illegal activity. These individuals were recorded without their knowledge and consent. Mr. Combs possesses compromising footage of every person who has attended his freak off parties and his house parties. So again, I'm just like, you know, why are we so, why, why is now like all of the media and everything, content bloggers, everyone is so obsessed. Where is Diddy? Is this the downfall? He sold off all his shares for his Revolt TV, 
um, media company. Uh, but that's because, you know, you have a, you, if you have a board, you, they don't want you heading that because you have this, you know, house rated or whatever. So yeah, is it a distraction? I think it is because it's a lot of things we need to be focused on. You need to be focused on what's going on in your local level. You know, who's, who's running for Congress? 435 seats are up for re-election in Congress. Hello? I'm it looks not- like, by the way, that the Republicans are uh, to take over the Senate and maintain control of yeah, the House. That's problem. And that's problem. I like that. One of the things is, is right now, one of the most crucial two things in front of everybody, well, actually three. One, First Amendment protection two, Second Amendment protection, three, the Fifth Amendment, and the general thing as far as it applies to the state, what's in the 14th Amendment, due process of law. Now, that's in the Bill of Rights when it comes to the feds, but the 14th Amendment extended it to the state. So we need the due process of law, freedom from self-incrimination in Fifth Amendment circumstances, and we need protection of the Second Amendment because it's getting extremely dangerous and the government can't protect us, the police can't protect us. So who's to protect us, particularly if we're disarmed and they don't want to touch the thugs? So then you get the situation with the First Amendment that is guaranteed by the Second, which is the right to assemble, address the government for redress of grievance, to speak freely without concern for whether somebody's feelings are hurt, but merely exchanging ideas vigorously so that in the arena of the public, freely exposed to ideas in candid and frank discussion thereof, the public can reach a consensus in what it wants to do. Now, we can't say certain things on YouTube without some kind of retaliatory action for putting stuff out that may be front page uh, news uh, for the day because it hurts somebody's feelings. Well, damn, where would this country be if the main consideration was somebody's feelings. We aren't that weak. And instead of land of the free and home of the brave, we would be home of the punked out and scared about to be taken over. Now, granted, whether we're actually home of the free, it's a goal and people are working on it. And if you aren't scared of adversity and don't mind fighting it, we'll get there. If you're scared, you won't be shit because you're just a punk. And punks get slapped across the head and run home from school. And our idea is when you get punked out, the idea is, oh, please don't do that to me anymore. Oh, fool, bam, bam, bam. You got to say, all right, that's no. Bam, you know, and say, let's get it on, see what you got. Why is the FBI trending on, um, on, on, on X? I have no idea, probably because they made the news and somebody's paying attention. Uh, FBI visits the home of a Muslim American woman, pro-Palestinian posts on Facebook. Uh, Yeah, that's the other thing. That may be why. That's what I'm talking about, about the First Amendment. You have no business going to visit somebody because of what they exercise, well, how they exercise their free speech rights. What they say is self-explanatory. They don't need to explain it to you. If they ask you what you said, you say, have you ever heard of the First Amendment? Well, I was exercising it. Well, what do you have to say? I take the Fifth Amendment. I have nothing else to say other than that I was exercising the First Amendment. I wish to speak with counsel before I say anything else. You got something better to do? Am I under arrest? Well, if I'm not, bye. Thank you. Please leave. You got a warrant? Oh, you can say that to the FBI. Hell yes. 
Never tell them you don't know what they're talking about. You don't, always say you have nothing to say and or you take the Fifth Amendment or you decline to give them a response because they'll often tell you what they're there for. We are here to see what you meant by this statement and whether you were so-and-so. Just say, I have nothing to say about that other than I was exercising my First Amendment rights. Further than that, I take the Fifth. Um, well, because you know why mm -hmm. it's really ridiculous. You get somebody with 14 counts in an indictment. The 14th count is making a knowingly false statement to a federal agency or a federal in, uh, official. So what happens is you, your client's not guilty on the 13 primary counts, but they said, we're here to investigate you for a bank robbery. And they say, I don't know anything about it. Well, it is told you you're here to be investigated for a bank robbery. So now they find you guilty because you said you didn't know anything about what they just told you about. It's really sophistry. It's a tragedy. And that's not the way American justice is supposed to work. Well, speaking of First Amendment, um, Trump lawyers, you know, they're, they're arguing how the First Amendment is supposed to work. Uh, Trump legal news prosecutors tell Judge McAfee the First Amendment doesn't apply to Trump's criminal intentions. Um, this and this, they were in court today arguing to have this case um, dismissed. Prosecutors who have charged former President Donald Trump with election interference and racketeering relating to his efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election in Georgia tell Judge McAfee that the First Amendment does not protect him from prosecution in the case. Bring Trump the headline back down. Bring the headline back down. You see it? Intention is what they have to prove in each and every case that the defendant intended to commit the offense or it's an offense that can be committed by recklessness or extreme negligence. So in other words, was it, in other words, it's like this. In the state of X, it's against the law to kick trash cans, okay? There is a trash can behind a screen and somebody comes along and he sees a roach. He doesn't see the trash can behind the screen and he kicks the roach. There's nothing illegal about stomping on or kicking a roach, but it is illegal to kick a trash can. He inadvertently kicks the trash can doing something legal. He had no intent to violate the law, so he is not guilty of intending to commit the crime of kicking the trash can. The very indictment reads he intended to commit this crime. So they're trying to negate their obligation of proving intent is a crucial element of the criminal offense they charge it with. Okay. Um, let's, let's finish reading this real quick. Um, uh, 20 tells judge McAfee, the first amendment does not protect him from prosecution in the case. Trump's lawyers tell the judge that contesting election results is protected by the constitution. Of course it is. Well, That's been counts. probably the number three most frequent complaint about that goes on that gets challenged in the country's history. Well, Fulton County prosecutor Donald Wakeford counters that each of the 10 felony counts Trump faces was employed as part of a criminal activity with criminal intentions. Here are the latest. God damn, counts. there you go. Here are the latest legal developments involving the presumptive Republican presidential nominee for 2024. Trump lawyer prosecutors spar over First Amendment protection. Key players, Judge McAfee, Fulton County prosecutor, Don the Wakeford. I guess he's part of Fannie Willis' office. Yeah, she's his boss. Trump lawyer, hey, Steve. Let's see. Oh, oh, this, this is important. Mm -hmm. To understand what we're dealing with, the prosecutorial entity is the elected district attorney. That's Fannie. The rest of them are permitted as her deputies or assistants. In other words, there is the marshal, deputy marshal. There is the sheriff, 
deputy sheriffs. See, the man in charge, like, for example, in Tennessee, you have the elected dep the elected sheriff is the bailiff of the criminal court in the county or the district. If there is more than one criminal court, then such of his deputies as are approved by the trial judges presiding in the other court may act in ba as bailiffs in his stead. So the person that's in charge that's ultimately responsible is the elected official. It's a constitutional office in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, uh, New York, New Jersey, all the other places. So, mm -hmm. yeah, these are, she's the one in charge. These are her servants, so to speak. Give me a I minute. just that interruption so that. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I was trying to pull this up. Um, speaking of Fannie and First Amendment and this the Georgia case election trial, um, because in the title, you know, Fannie Willis Crisis, Fulton County, immediate review should be had. Trump co defendant in Georgia Rico case allowed to argue Fannie Willis overstepped her authority by seeking an election related indictment, right? Yeah, that's right. And the judge said, okay. Now, see, this was the only one of the defendants that was not allowed to make bond. Mm -hmm. The one black man in this, this witch, Mammy here, decided to set an example by somebody black going along against her little plantation party line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Look at her. <laughs> she just love to get that mouth open. You want to word for it. <laughs> Certainly it's been illustrated for at least being a big mouth that talks too damn much. And she, I mean, I was going through the other day, I came up with at least 19 federal and state crimes that she had implicated herself in with one of the worst dumb crook things I've ever seen in my 50 years of doing this. So it, was it says, says co-defendant in the Georgia Racketeer and Rico, an election subversion case against former President Donald Trump will be allowed to immediately appeal a series of court trial rulings against him to the Georgia Court of Appeals. Superior, uh, Fulton Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee on Monday granted a certificate of immediate review allowing yeah. Harrison Floyd, the former leader of Black Voices for Trump, to request a hearing from the higher court about his procedural motion to dismiss the case. Read the opinion. You know why he did that? Same ring he put in the 24-page uh, opinion on her dealing with Trump, where he called her a liar. He said she's mendacious, which means liar. Mm -hmm. uh, several times she said her credibility was zero. If she was not believable, she presented false and misleading statements to the court. So to a great extent, what happened with this guy was based on the representations of the prosecutor's office, which is under her, under her charge. So if she's lying about one thing you caught her on, then she may be presumed or inferred to have lied or misled the court on vital information on other things. So he's saying... Let's have a review. Uh, this is so important that what I initially ruled upon, everything's going to stop till we get this resolved. This is what you call an interlocutory uh, uh, appeal, so to speak. Uh, McAfee has on several prior occasions denied arguments advanced by Floyd that Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis was operating beyond her jurisdiction when her office began an election-related investigation and subsequently when the charges were filed so in the past he did not arguments advanced by floyd but now he's saying you know what i'm gonna give you the opportunity to appeal because she overreached now is it till he changed his mind it sounds yeah, he's flexible so you can do that but did he change his mind because she acted like a buffoon on that uh, yeah that's kind of what he says <laughs> you know that I'm going to testify. Well, ma'am, we're arguing over whether or not you should. Well, I decided I'm going to testify. 
Right. It says Floyd has been pressing the issue since October 2023, arguing Willis office did not have authority to investigate or um, presentment authority to bring election related charges against the defendant absent a referral from the state election board. The state replied to those arguments last November and Floyd's attorney replied to the state last December. The court first ruled against Floyd arguments regarding the remit of Willis power on January 9th, finding that Willis did in fact have concurrent jur jurisdiction, which peach state election officials and that she did not need a referral from the board to pursue election subversion charges. You know what that indicates? No, what does it indicate? I don't know what I just read. What I, I, I what it read was is technically what the defense is saying is she didn't have jurisdiction because there was not a referral or a complaint from the state election commission. So he ruled the, uh, in favor of Fannie Willis's contention that the local DA had concurrent jurisdiction with the federal, uh, well, not federal, but the state election commission. So what he's saying now is that based on some of the representations and some of the things done, he's not so sure that there was not inappropriate collaboration going on up around and about uh, Mammy's office here that renders the whole thing inappropriate. So under the circumstances of this particular case and her demonstrated misconduct, mm -hmm. he thinks that an appellate court should take a look at it because it's too important to go forward at this point and allow someone to railroad this thing through only to cause a manifest injustice. See, the judge is becoming very cognizant that there are 360 million people in the United States, an extensive portion of which are eligible to vote for their local electoral college members and that he does not want to deprive them of that opportunity uh, on the basis of some sham contrivance, uh, contrivance concocted by Fanny and her folk. So he's saying, take a look at it. It's worth looking at because it's an important issue. And uh, I am just a lower court. This needs to go all the way up so we can decide what to do. Mm-hmm. Good decision. He's acting way beyond his years. I'd say a 34 person is not really mature enough in life to be a good judge, but this one is proving the exception. So it's not looking good for her office because, you know, now this judge is saying, you know what, I'm going to give you the opportunity to appeal it, right? I guess to get his charges thrown out. Um, in other words, so an appellate court can rule on this crucial determinative issue before the matter goes and wastes a lot of time. In other words, if the uh, pellet goes says, oh, you can't do that. That's dispositive. It's dead. And see, that just shows her racket. Because what we are confronted with right now looks like there's a hustle between her and Wade uh, that was contrived. So she would okay any demand he made for compensation without question. The money would come back and they'd split it. There'd be a kickback, which, by the way, is a felony, and it falls yeah. under their Organized Crime Act or their RICO Act. So then they have what looks like, to all intents and purposes, with the extent of the undocumented, unreceded cash transactions, it looks like money laundering. So remember, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and may be used in evidence against you. This is the freedom from being, uh, from self-incrimination. And it's not confession to a crime. It's incriminating yourself, which is exactly what she has done with her big mouth. Now, I was looking to see was she in court today, but she wasn't. However, um, if... See, see, she could have had somebody in her office handle it. She chose to appoint her boyfriend so he could get paid an exorbitant amount of money she would approve and they could split it. Remember, right. she's saying she's broke. That's what the that's what she can get taken down for because she's implicated herself in that kind of scheme. So just 
So, so for right now, fast forward, right? Because it looks like, listen, if if Floyd he appeals and if he wins, you know, that's bad for her office. Um, Trump lawyer, you know, or today they were arguing they want the case dismissed um, via First Amendment. If that's granted, then basically it's done. You know what I'm saying? She's done. It's it's a lot of things going on. And now, right now, it's the um the Democrats are saying she's talking too much, right? Democrats yeah, run a damn mouth off. Right. Democratic strategist scolds Fannie Willis over media blitz. She she's got to bring it down. I'm gonna play this. Um this yeah, well, before we get there, one thing that's going on right here. See, with what's going on now, Trump doesn't have to be in personal appearance. His lawyers can appear. What his opponents are trying to do is get something set up so he'll have to personally sit there through the hours of what's going on. And that's why they want this one thing in New York to go to trial April 15th. So he will be there. And then they want to get a sham conviction that is l almost certainly going to be overturned on appeal if it results in a conviction so they can have the unprecedented opportunity to incarcerate and set no bond on somebody who is one political party's candidate for president of the United States. They want this April thing tried. So when it drags out, he will be sitting in court for weeks. Then if he gets locked up, they won't set a bond and he will be in custody when he's supposed to be campaigning for president. And this will be the first time in 235 years of the history of the United States since they adopted, uh, ratified the Constitution in 1789 that has happened. What with all of the scoundrels that have been in office, in this 235 year period, this is the first time because this is the only time you have had a bunch of unscrupulous, dishonorable, ghastly idiots who want to subvert the U.S. Constitution so you can use the criminal process for strictly political purposes. Right. So I want to um, play this clip. A bunch of bozos trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you have cancer. Now, the first time it wasn't an ad. Now it's an ad. No, don't hit learn more. We'll be stuck with the whole damn commercial. Right. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, wait. Damn. Oh. Two things. One, I think it will be important for people to be able to see it because that way when Trump comes out and says whatever he's going to say, well, we can say, well, let's go to the tape and see what actually happened. And I actually think with someone like Donald Trump, we need that. That being said, Bonnie Willis, I think, has already made herself a character in this saga. She's got to bring it down and stay focused on doing the job of prosecuting this case. I wish she would stop doing interviews and really focus on just prosecute the case just and be very serious in the courtroom no flair nothing fancy just the facts ma'am in other words she's a political hack she's not that good at the job of prosecuting she's very selective about what she's been doing you can see that and she's prosecuted some school teachers for a rico violation a rap star for his lyrics uh, for a rico violation um former president for simply exercising his first amendment not just free speech but remember to petition the government for redress of grievance. And that can be by demonstration, communication or whatever. And it's also got to do with a technical thing, even though he's of interest, he's still president of the United States and this impacts the operation of the electoral college. And there is this law in place called popularly the Confidence in Elections Act of 1877, back in the 19th century. 
And that is supposed to be a situation where if there is a lack of public confidence in the outcome of an election, the president shall instruct the vice president to decline to ratify the electoral college count and to call for the appointment of a special 15 man committee, five from the house, five from the Senate and five from the Supreme court. So this 15 man committee is supposed to take a minimum of 10 days to conduct an audit of the results and or such extra time as is reasonably necessary to conduct a full investigation. So in other words, you can say that part of what he's doing is his job. He's supposed to get information to determine whether or not he instructs his vice president, Pence, to decline to endorse the proposed electoral college return and call for the creation of a commission that is on the books. And as a matter of fact, when January 6th went down, that was the next matter on the agenda until this disturbance occurred and Nancy Pelosi exercised her executive authority to table the matter. So when he asked Pence not to sign, that's within his duties and responsibilities as per the 1877 Act. And this would be in line with his official duties of president to investigate or vigorously inspire people to follow the law, which there's nothing against that. So we're stuck right in the middle of the First Amendment situation. Now, I haven't heard his lawyers articulate that, but it's a constitutional thing that occurs to me so well you know um <clears throat> she's talking too much and it's everything it's just yeah, about yeah. everything she's accusing donald trump she's actually doing so doing it's like it he's well. fighting his first amendment and she's going to say well i have the right the first amendment right to speak right but it's like, yeah, it's just, just, just stop talking. Stop talking about you're the face of the feminist movement, you know, and all this. And what the hell does that have to do with justice? Justice. Right. If it's not, if it's not, if it's not you being black, if it's not you being a woman, now you the poster child for the feminist movement. Like, it's, it's nothing. It has nothing to do with your job. Just do your job. And actually, I'll accept her representation. Let's take it. You know what it also shows damn fine reason not to vote for a damn thing democratic that will support this garbage turn the buzzers out they're trying to corrupt the constitution and turn us into a totalitarian society ah! so we got about 15 more minutes and i said that we're going to do overtime taking phone calls a part of me is like i don't feel like loading up the website should i still should we still do the overtime for one hour why not over? hell what are we doing so, it's Okay, so should I do it? Should I do it here or should we go to the website? Or should I put should I put a poll and have them decide? Do you want me to take the phone calls here on YouTube or take the phone calls on the website? Well, YouTube is so restrictive, we gotta act like we're dancing around in a kindergarten. Well, the call is calling, they don't ask out they don't ask outlandish questions. So, you know, well, but just in case. I mean, but YouTube is so poisonous and because, okay, so if I do it on a website, you know, when I end this, I'm gonna have I have to go to a website and create a whole new stream. Well, let's stay where we are. We got to flow. Okay. All right. So, all right. So what don't, we we do don't want to be that boat that crashes into the bridge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have a malfunction. <laughs> By the way, back to right, that. I'll be having malfunctions. Like. By the way, the way they do that is they've got this pylon and it hangs down below the boat and there's an electric motor in it and there's a propeller attached to the electric motor and this whole thing pivots to steer the ship. Well, if the electric motor goes, electric power goes down, there's nothing to either turn this thing and there's nothing to make the electric motor turn. So you just, oh shit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like going down the car the roadway in a semi truck and your steering wheel comes off like what the hell so okay so guys so what I'm going to do is take the phone calls here so 
we end the show at two hour mark. So we're going to go on overtime for one hour, open up the phone lines. Um, that'll be 11 Eastern time. Um, real quick. I want to go to, um, I want to bring this up. Al Sharpton on a morning oh joke. Oh my God! He said, "Public enemy number one." Wait a minute, let me let me do it. Let me read it. Al Sharpton on a morning Joe saying that Donald Trump is running a white supremacist campaign. Remind me, who was it that allegedly led a march with a chant "Kill all the Jews" in the nineties? Um, right, that was Al Sharpton. Um, if you took the hood off a KKK member, they're Democrats, right? So I want to play this clip real quick. It's a quick, it's 46 seconds. I think that he has uh, taken off any cover that he is really running a clear white supremacist campaign. Uh, he has stood there and called whites that tried to stop the certification of an election, which is tantamount to trying to overthrow the government He's called them hostages while they are real hostages in the Middle East. At the same time, imagine if you were a, a family member of a hostage in the Middle East, hearing him calling people that tried to overthrow an election a hostage equivalent to them. And then he's going to call people of color uh, that are coming from Central Latin America, Haiti, animals. I think that he has uh, taken... Okay, so he's calling, basically calling Trump um, a white supremacist. <laughs> I call him a goddamn. Uh... <laughs> the okay. man is committing genocide against chickens. He's eating so many poor chickens. He's public enemy number one for the chicken population. He a chicken eating pimp preacher. He ain't even got a pulpit, and he's talking nonsense. And the first thing is his ignorance is extraordinary. As I just pointed out, the Confidence in Elections Act of 1877 demands that when there is a lack of public confidence in an election process, that the vice president decline to accept the vote count proposed from the electoral college and appoint a 15-man committee, five from the House, five from the Senate, five from the Supreme Court, to review and audit the mm -hmm. proposed election results, and to take a minimum of 10 days or such extra time as is reasonably necessary to accomplish the task. So stupid bozo, go back to eating your chicken, and maybe you can get a handout from Chick Fil A. <laughs> Chick Fil A. <laughs> yeah, Chick Fil A or Popeyes. You, you look like one of them fools who went out there for two and a half hours in the ninety degree sun to get a chicken sandwich, and or <laughs> Colonel. <laughs> you go back to eating your chicken and talking your bull and. You know, go stand amongst people and resist terrorism. And you be quivering. Oh, man. Oh, man. Quick. We shall. We shall. Over. Like, come on, fool. Damn. <laughs> that shit is dead. Been dead for 55 years. And, you hey, know, so I put a gas pole. your head again and you feel comfortable and maybe you start acting right. I put a poll in the chat. And I said, should um, should open, I meant to put, should I? Should I open the phone lines on YouTube or the website? And right now, 72 votes so far. And they're saying 90% YouTube, 10% the website. So. Uh, Let's go YouTube. So I made you, okay. So today I'll stay on YouTube, but I might have to train someone to just have the website set up already. So I could just flip it um to the to the website um cuz i don't i don't feel like doing it I, and i think me thinking about having to do it just makes me tired well leave it where it is let's do it where we is no open phone like right. you know so the phone line's going to open example, up in about in about not, 9 minutes hmm? okay that's an example of why you should be careful 
about eating fried foods. Your cholesterol level will build up. You will get plaque in your carotid arteries and it will cut down or restrict the flow of blood to your brain and you won't be thinking clearly. So obviously Reverend Al uh, has been getting clogged arteries in his neck and maybe he needs an angioplasty to clear them out so he doesn't think so weirdly. Thank you, Heather, for the super chat. And guys, please send me your super chats if you have a question. Trevor Jackson TV. Guys, go and subscribe to Trevor Jackson TV on YouTube. Um, he has great content. Um, Catman, contrast this with... Oh, oh, we answered that already. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, 50 Cent is messy, yes. Um, I so love your podcast, Dana. And as always, love Judge Joe from Paula. Um, thank you. And Miss Bone. I say Miss Miss Bone. Miss Bone. Miss Bone. I don't know. Do it on the website. I prefer it uncensored. Well, I'm too tired today. I'm By the way, let me ask you a question. It's uh -huh. supposed to be Reverend Al Sharpton, right? Uh huh. Where does he preach? <laughs> and can you or, or see him? Can you see him? Or, 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 yeah, can you see him delivering a sermon? What the hell would he talk about in terms of a message to the people that would keep your soul from going to hell? Nothing. But that's what I'm saying. So, you know. He must work for the devil. Oh, you've been called. It's, it's a money grab for him. It's so the soul. That's how he's pimping it all out. He gets that pulpit with CNN and they keep firing his ass, but they bring him back. So he gets called in to be the showpiece plantation Negro. He's the slave preacher and he gets to get up and go do his thing. And he say, it's horrible. They abusing massa. All them folk from up north, they coming down here and they interviewing with this boy from Delaware who is from an old slave state and they's just making him be mean and he can't deal with it. And we just loves is on the plantation. Mm. Well, no, no. So let me do um, a quick recap. So we talked about um, the good times animation cartoon and then I put the petition, I pinned it in the chat and I am going to put in a description, please sign a petition to boycott that Netflix animation of good times. Cause it's pure trash. Um, we talked about Shirley Chisholm, the movie and the woman herself, um, the Baltimore bridge. Is it a scam? Is it a conspiracy or was it just a plain accident? Um, of course, Diddy, the Diddy update, the Diddy bop, you know, listen, uh, first of all, Diddy is done. He cannot come from this. He cannot, he cannot come back. And it's not so much, even if he's never charged criminally, it's the fact that you have all of these lawsuits, right? With people saying that you do all these deviant acts and you've been doing it throughout the years. So every time somebody listens to your music or see you at an event, or even if you try to perform, that's all they're going to see. He is finished. And you know what? I think it's time for him to just sit down, go to Bali with Russell Simmons, just go somewhere and sit down and just be out of sight. You know, well, that's who we made our celebrities. Right. And I, I, I honestly, it's like, honestly, I don't want to know. This is why celebrities need to be separate from politics and everything else, because I don't want to know what you do behind closed doors. If I enjoy your music, I want to enjoy it. But if I know all the deviant stuff you do, then that's the only thing I'm going to be thinking about. And I can't enjoy the music. You, you see what I'm saying? Well, like he and the president, former president, were exchanging sweat. Wasn't that cute? <laughs> Somehow. I Considering the reputation for them both, bathhouse Barry and <laughs> <laughs> listen, I'm I'm tired. Great show. Thank you to all the callers. Most importantly, thank you to everybody that sent in a super chat. Everyone in the love room, everyone listening, sign that petition, boycott good times animation cartoon show. Sign a petition. I'm gonna put the petition in the comment section. I'm gonna pin it in the comment section. So sign it, sign it, sign it. Let's start putting out positive. Did, let me ask you a 
content, you know, and move away from the ignorance. Let me ask you a question. Did they have a character in this animation playing JJ? I think, yeah, they did, but it was like a revised part of it, but <coughs> that KJ character was just a little too stupid. Yeah. All right. I don't want to rehash. I don't want to go back. So I'm, I'm ready to end. So say good night. Good night. Good night. And we'll see you live Monday, Monday night. Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the rest of your week. Oh, um, uh, Easter. Happy Easter to everybody that celebrate Easter. And dip your eggs in some barbecue sauce. JJBBQ.com. Yeah. Get yourself done. Let me guess. Judge Joe Brown Barbecue. Available on Amazon. And if you have Amazon Prime, you get free shipping. Because if you order it online, the shipping cost is more than a bottle of the barbecue sauce. So you do better getting a package of three or one of the deals we offer you about getting uh, the sauce um, and the seasoning and such like. So JJBBQ.com. Judge Joe Brown Barbecue. And you can also get it on. Oh, Amazon. tomorrow's Good Friday. Yes. Happy Good Friday and happy Easter. So everybody that celebrate and everybody, everybody who's in the middle of Ramadan. Blessings. It's also OK for. I don't want a history lesson right now. We gotta go. No, I'm just saying it's also OK for Orthodox Muslims as well. There are no offensive things in it. All right. Good night. Bye. Oh, one more thing. The phone call segment, I'm cutting it off and I'm going to upload it on the website. Okay. Good night. Bye.